Excellent. So, the, uh, uh, so I'm Kevin Marquette. You know, I've been doing community stuff for quite a while, and I did. Uh, I've been enjoying some code golf, and that's what we're talking about today. Is like the Zen of writing really ugly code. So, so, so to just kind of jump into it, like, what is code golf, right? Like, that's it's it's like this. It's like a challenge or puzzles where you're given a problem to solve, and the goal is to use the fewest number of characters possible. So sometimes the challenges themselves might not be that complicated because the hard part is how do you strip away those last you know, few characters here and there. And um, it can be um, a lot of fun sometimes. Okay, so, so why code golf, right? It's, I like it because it's like unique problem solving. Like I've got this skill set of PowerShell that I use in my you know, every day all the time and uh, code golf like lets you think about it in a different way. Like you're using your skill set in a way you just hadn't used before, and it's good for finding, helping yourself find like creative solutions to problems. Because sometimes you know you might be just writing install scripts all day long, and you're kind of doing the same type of stuff over and over. And this lets you like expand the way you think about problem solving. And they're also uh, good for like interview practice. Like as you're getting more advanced in your career with PowerShell, you'll start finding in the interviews, like, hey, let's do this little code challenge. Like as you get more of that DevOps shift, um, writing PowerShell as part of an interview is starting to become a more and more common you know, um, interview piece. So solving these problems like Code Golf. And there's several sites, um, places that, that uh, um, give you the option to do code challenges so you don't have to golf everything. But it's, um, yeah, just a good way to do old things in a new way. Now, I'm, talking, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about this one specific website, uh, code.golf, because they have PowerShell support. So you can actually, they have lots of languages, you know, Python, C Sharp, Bash, like whatever your, your language is, but PowerShell is one that they support that they can run code and they can validate it, and they have their own leaderboards just for that language. Now, I think I was seventh when I took this screenshot, but there's quite a few of us now. Where am I at? I'm 11th on the board. But as we bounce through here, there's several different, they call them holes. But we've got challenges anywhere from um, mathematical, let's do prime numbers, to you know, 12 days of Christmas, like how do you output that and, you know, and generate that song effectively? Um, they've got Sudoku solvers, uh, like just a whole range of different type of things to push different, uh, different skills. And, uh, okay, so the disclaimer is, <laughs> so I'm pretty well known for like some of my deep dive articles um, on some PowerShell fundamentals. And I always like to very, be very, I include everything. Like, everything you wanted to know, and I'd see some of these edge things, and I'm like, do I want to tell people about this? Because if I do, they're going to use it. <laughs> so this is the place where I'm actually sharing all of those things that I never want to see in production code. And, and, and part of this is because our production code, you want that readable. Like, we're gonna, you're going to spend, um, like, as a dev, you spend 10 times more of your effort to spend reading code than writing it because you're always going back, you're looking, you're referencing things, so your time is mostly spent reading code. Make it easy for yourself to read your code, and, 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 and you'll um, thank yourself for that. But yeah, but code golf is, is none of that. So let's hop into a couple uh, tips and tricks here and run from there. So get my shell set up. Excellent. All right, so, uh, so a little bit of my notation here. Um, so I'm not going to run every single line every time. So I kind of grabbed a little clip of what the output would be. So like here for get date, it'll give us a string. So 
if you're like looking ahead or I'm not running the, the current line I'm on, you can kind of get a guess of what those little, what those little symbols are, are, are telling us. So I got strings, numbers, and then as we get into um, the challenges, I'll start prefixing them saying, oh, this section is eight characters long. So you'll see we'll start at like, you know, 300 characters and as we whittle pieces down, I'll have that little notation there to, to tell us like how, uh, how small we're getting. And if you are doing the editing like in the website for Code Golf, if I pull up a challenge here. There's, like if you're actually doing your dev work in here, it'll actually have a real time counter to where you're at. And like I'll start in VS Code, but sometimes I'll just end up in here, I'll do all my iterating and tweaking like in their interface, because you can just test, run, test, run, and, and they validate. And the other nice thing is like as we run the code, right, it'll actually, like this is one where here's what we expected the output to be, and here's what the actual output is. So one of the first things I do when I'm starting a challenge is I'll just hit run to see all the, if there's test data, I'll get, I'll get the inputs and see what the output is. Uh, and that makes it easier if you're trying to interpret what they're saying in, in the instructions by just knowing what the output looks like. And then if something is, is wrong when you run it, it'll clearly tell you, oh hey, something was wrong here, and not only that, but this specific line of your output was wrong. So you're getting that, 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 that good real-time feedback. Um, so, excellent. And then, what else? Okay, so working with Code Golf, at the end of the challenge, you're always outputting something. Right, and they're, they're capturing like all the streams and like your, anything that falls into the pipeline. So while you can use write host to get output out for the challenge to see it, um, write output is just as valid, but also, so is just like dumping objects onto the pipeline. So if I just drop a string there, PowerShell will display it and they'll capture that as your output. So right away, by just not using write output or write host, it's actually, you know, giving you a nice clean output for the, uh, for the challenge. And then one more nuance, we'll, we'll revisit this one a little bit later, but um, there will be some challenges that provide arguments or parameters, like, uh, like here's some values, do something, give us the results. And in that site, all of them will come in as an array of the arguments. And one of my samples, we'll dive in that closer and actually see what that looks like. But when this pops up, it's, yeah, we'll basically take the arguments for each over it and then process whatever's in there. And uh, there are some with Unicode characters, but nice thing is you can copy and paste them from the help and instructions into your, into your code. So you don't have to worry about like, how do I, how do I find this emoji or whatever? No, I just copy it out of their instructions and paste it into the PowerShell and you can reference and use it. And I've got an example that we're, Gonna be playing with those a little bit too. All right, so the first place you save room in Code Golf is with white space. All right, so uh, if you're doing your editing in VS, VS Code, you can actually go into your settings and set this render white space all to kind of let you see where, where uh, some of these are. So if I go and add this to my VS Code file, say it was all, excellent. And then I don't know well if it shows up in the dark, but you kind of see these little dots. Uh, did I have this installed? Yeah, there we go. Like dot, 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 like you see these little dots showing me there's white space. So that might be one way to find things if, depending on how good your font is, it's showing you stuff. And then the other tip is, um, you know, there are some code-friendly fonts that make some things easier to see. Um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it on for the moment here. All right, so then, all right, there's a lot of white space you don't need. So here's an example here where I'm just gonna trim out literally all the white space in this example, right, because I don't need it between the brace, I don't need it inside of it, I don't need the new line afterwards, just one line, like, just by having a return line in here, like that's one more character, 
right? So if I can actually get something on a single line, I'm saving a character every time I can put something on, on, in line on the same line. Uh, math, so operations, they don't need spaces between them either. So you can just take your calculations and just crunch them right up next to each other. And even if they're variables, variable names, since most of these aren't, um, aren't symbols that are valid for a variable name, unless you're doing some special syntax. But that takes too many characters, I'm gonna, I'm a, so I'm not even gonna reference it in here. Uh, one thing that surprised me as I was first learning um, Code Golf was that some things like operators, ooh, actually I'm gonna come back to that one. Uh, the pipeline. So like for each object, like this is where we start using aliases, right? Like for each object, production code, type that, you know, it, it's better to type that one out. You're on the, on the shell, on the CLI, yeah, we can use the alias. Code golf, you'll only ever use the alias. Uh, but yeah, so these lines oh, pop up here. So yeah, these lines are all doing the same thing, effectively. And uh, so I've got my array. And so we're familiar with how these work, but I really want to highlight is that we don't need any spaces in here when you're doing pipeline stuff. So you can just, again, cram, those, cram that right together. Uh, okay, so here, yeah, here's a jump thing just a little bit. So it's the um, operators, like the comparison operators, they don't need spaces around them either. So like here, I can do five equals five, you know, if uh, run that. But here, like even though that's, that, that's a number, like it knows this is an operator and can immediately start the next thing. So it could be a number, a variable, um, something else. So, so here's the first place you can start stealing spaces is around all of your operators. Um, like that, and it doesn't matter if they're variable names or not, those still work just as beautifully. And then when you start chaining stuff together, right, if you do like an and statement, like, you know what, this is all, all just smushed right together. And, yeah, we don't need any of those spaces. Okay. Uh, so then we get to the other operators, like join. The join statement, you know what, that thing can do a lot and doesn't need many spaces either. So you can actually have like your item, but join right next to it, and uh, uh, your item, but it was just, it's just so odd staring at a join statement next to a number, you know, like there's uh, uh, really unique use cases for something like that. And then the join operator actually has another mode where if you actually flip it, so you take nothing, join it to your item, it just smashes everything together. So there's like no spaces in this join statement, All right? So if I have my array initiated here, if I do, like if I do just the array, right, you'll see how it dumps them out, you know, one after the other. Do, 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 do. But if I run this one just above it, it's actually effectively joining them next to the no spaces in between, no, no separators. So there's, there's no spike, and like to start saving um, some characters. Uh, split, so a very, very similar story here, right? We got the, uh, we can, yeah, don't need any spaces, we can split stuff right next to it. So, while, like in your production code, you might say, yeah, key value pairs, but in code golf, you're like, if I can get rid of those extra quotes, there's two characters I can save if I use some weird delimiter like a zero. Like, you get to cheat in your own code golf to allow yourself to do things like this. And uh, split does the same thing too, right? So this will, actually, does that work? Yeah, so here it's automatically splitting on spaces. So I can do dash split your string in spaces. It'll uh, dump that into an array for you. Uh, okay, now replace. More fun replace, right? Okay, so replace basically takes you know, an array of parameters at the end. Uh, one of my big aha moments was realizing that you don't actually need the second item if you just want replace to remove something. So here if I say, replace dash with, just replace dash, it will strip that out of the string and just give me all these things in one line uh, back to back. Um, here's another example where I'm just you know, yanking out a number, showing I don't really need the quotes on anything. And you can also 
chain your replaces back to back. So you can do this, replace this, replace this. Now, don't be doing this in production. <laughs> it already gets ugly enough, right? But what could go wrong? yeah, what could go wrong? Absolutely. But <clears throat> yes, but as an operator, there's these, these special parsing rules. Um, all right. So okay, so working with arrays of strings. All right, like it's like in production, like. This is a nice, clean way to say, up here's an array of, of strings we're going to work with. And you know we can easily inline them. Um, but this is actually optional, this, this, this array notation, if you actually have like commas in between them. So just by having a string with commas, this is effectively becomes an array um, to work with. So there's you know, a couple more characters you, can, you generally don't need. Uh, but what if you just didn't have to put the quotes in there either? Like, if we just make the quotes optional, you could do like write output and put your strings there because it, it, it assumes your input is strings, right? This is a handy one on the shell. And then with the alias echo, like I can't take how often I'm on the shell and I just, yeah, echo this, 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 and that. So I don't have to do the whole, you know, VS code edit, you know, whatever. It's, it's a really handy shell um, hack. And, um, but yeah, so there's that trade-off, like, echo takes a few characters, but if your string is long enough, it more than makes up for not having to put the quotes around every item. Um, uh, okay, so I kind of talked about splitting strings, right? So we can ask, depending on that, we have a string that we split, um, and I had this example above, we're splitting on spaces. There might be more complicated examples, where you actually have the spaces in there, so you can you know split on the on, on the on the comma. So if the string is long enough, it's cheaper to combine it and split afterwards versus you know having having the quotes for every item. And uh, and then again, if you're if you if you can choose whatever delimiter you want, you can shove in something that takes you know less quotes at the end. Uh, so here here's another fun discovery of me of mine was like here strings right. They let you do multi-line strings. You know, you, you use the symbol. Uh, the nuance is like this at sign at the end, like it has to be on a line all by itself, left justified, right? But this is the exact contents of the string. If you use single quotes, if you use double quotes, you can put variables in there, single quotes, you know, it's just like a normal um, single quoted uh, literal string. But those, but strings support multiple lines. Like this is valid PowerShell. Don't do this in production, <laughs> but uh, you can uh, uh, define a string with, with your returns in there, and it doesn't have the requirement of being left left justified. Although it's still, if it's tabbed in, your, that white space would, would wouldn't be in there. Um, and and then and again, and the, again, and if you need to have a way to you know have lots of text and then break it up, um, we could always, you know, split it on the new line as a way to uh, get multiple I separate items. Um, okay, so variables. Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay, uh, deconstruction. So we all know we can assign a variable to something, right? Value equals this. Uh, there's this handy feature of PowerShell in some language that where I think it's generally referred to as deconstruction, where if you have an array, or array of on the right, and you assign it to multiple variables on the left, like it will actually assign the, the A to the first and the B to the second. So if you have like a function that returns two values, you can say, you know, this thing, comma that thing, as, and, and capture those separately versus having to grab the array and index into it. Um, yeah, so here's the same. Like if I run this, my first and second will have those two values uh, as as A and B. Uh, a great example use case is like splitting an email address, right? Like split gives you an array. So if I have an email, I split it on that sign. I can now say user domain equals that instead of having index zero, index one, to find those two after you use a split. 
So this is real handy. Um, um, you can do this when you protection scripts. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like this actually that actually makes stuff uh, cleaner. Um, now there's some magic you can do, you can do, and you might use in some challenges, where if you have multiple items, the first item goes to the first variable, and everything else goes to the second one. So you have a case where it's like I, I just need to pull the first thing off and let everything else fall into the second variable. Um, um, this is exactly how you could uh, how, how we'd approach that one. Who then assigning null like sometimes you need null in things, uh, uh, and null is quite a few characters. But if you have an opportunity where you're assigning a couple of variables, you can do the trick where where I'm basically getting a into the first one, and the second one gets everything else, which is nothing. Right? There's another because I'm, I'm 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 saving that new line, and I don't, have to, I don't even need the word null in there. So uh, um, that's a handy trick for code golf is knowing when you can use that to save um, save a line of code. And another nice little trick is it can be used to swap um, variables. So if I have these two already defined as a and b, instead of doing let me put this one to the third variable and move this one over and then shove this one back to the original, right? We can just in line just say, yeah, just put the first and second equal to the second and first, and you swap them in one line of code. Um, we can also do chain assignments. So if I need the same thing set to multiple things, you know, we can just say, you know, first equals second equals third, and they'll all get the same the same value. So it basically cascades right down the right down the line. So Excellent. Ooh, so, um, so normally when you, when you assign a variable, there's like no return output, right? So when I do n equals a, when we run this, based on the shell here, there's no output from that. There is a, if we actually put parentheses around that, we can actually get PowerShell to actually do the assignment and give us the result of that assignment. So here's a way we can do n equals a and give us that value at the same time um, is something we could work with in a maybe more complex um, piece of logic. Uh, and then adding one. So, all right, simple syntax, you know, n equals n plus one. Uh, you know, we're probably familiar with like, you know, n plus equals one, adds one to, you know, increments it. Um, there's a syntax, you know, famous from uh, C, C plus plus, where if you have a variable and do plus plus, that's the increment operator. And there's two versions of it. Uh, and, th and, th and, th and, th and this can be, and this is confusing. So the first one is uh, basically use the value n and increment it afterwards. And the next one is increment n and then use it. Um, now, Sometimes you won't notice it because they're both assignment and PowerShell's not gonna spit out the value either way. But if you're doing scenarios where you are incrementing it and getting the value, um, then it becomes really important. So, so basically like if this was zero, I actually get the value zero, it'd add one, it'd be one the next time I go to use it in the next loop. Where this trick is like, oh, if I need to start from one, my zero would get, I get zero plus one and then get the value. And um, there's a lot of code golf challenges where you're just lot, often doing like off by one type problem solving. And I will be like, oh, it was this side or this side. Like I am often testing which one is actually getting me the right one or zero in the right spot in some of these, in some of these challenges. Um, yeah, so here, here's, here's basically the same example with, with, with some numbers behind it, like where if, uh, if I uh, assign these both to one, and then I add uh, j plus 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 20, in a mathematical operation here, I think it's actually giving you the value to use. So I basically, I got the value one, uh, return the value 20, but if I check what the value in j is here, right, I'll say it's, it's, it's two. But here's a case where, yeah, we incremented it before we use it, so it's basically it's a, 
one plus one plus twenty is twenty two, and the end after the you know after the operation, the the, the two is kept in there. Um, excellent. Okay, so that's kind of more of the same examples. All right, so. Quite often in code golf, you're looping over stuff, right? You're iterating numbers, like, give me the first 100 primes. We start from, you know, one and we, and we work through the list. So there's many different ways to do loops, you know, um, for each nice, nice common approach to it. Um, and then we've also got, like, our for loop, right? Like, you know, n equals whatever. So we basically have the, like, initialization, the condition, and the increment. And one, really interesting thing about the for loop is that these pieces are all optional, which is very unique to PowerShell, which means that if you need an infinite loop, you can do a forever loop. Which is smaller than a while one loop. Oh, I actually got to kill that. <laughs> uh, Why you don't do this in production? I know, I know. Cool. Caught me hard on that one. Okay. Yeah, infinite loops are bad. Oh, I gotta rerun this one. And then excellent. Ooh, a uh, fun tip. Um, one thing I really love about VS Code is the way you can like navigate through code, right? Like I, I got this function, I can do right click, go to definition. Um, whatever, it, there is also a jump backwards to where you just were, and I've bound that to one of my side buttons. So even though I went to a different spot in a different file, like, you know, over here, I, I, can, I can hit my go back button. Ah, it doesn't jump files, I guess. If I put focus here, I can go back to where I was. I don't know. Just, just an aside, but there is a way to jump backwards or forward in your code. It's really, really convenient. All right, so, but I, I need tighter loops, tighter loops. So you probably know where we're going with this, is that we're going to use the pipeline, right? Because this is a nice, clean syntax where we say 1 to 100 for each, right? So basically, I'm down to like 12 characters to do the numbers 1 through 100. Um, which is so much tighter than, you know, a nice long for each that is like 25. Yep, 25 characters. Um, and then just kind of calling out then, then filtering, like we know, you know, we're, com we're familiar with like we're objects and we got the alias with the question mark, right? So if we can do our filtering on things. Um, this is also good for when you want to like, like, do a calculation, but you don't want to return the value back. Like, it, it could basically, like, you know, hide some, uh, hide some uh, output from falling through the pipeline. Um, but what's fun about this is that some of these filtering, um, especially these operators, they work on collections and we can do the filtering for you. So here, if I have an array and I say, is this array greater than three, instead of saying true or false, it gives me everything that is greater than three. So in this case, um, yeah, four, five, six, four, five, six. Uh, this can be fun because this, uh, this trick also works with matches, like doing the match operator. So here if I have you know, an array of strings, and I say give me everything that has this pattern in it, it will automatically filter it down to you know, just that list and I don't have to do the whole you know, for each object loop. So that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a handy one. And then, and then one more piece of magic that not everybody is aware of, or actually surprised me when I first learned it, is that PowerShell has what we call like soft aliases for all the get commands. So any command that's like get dash and, and, and the thing like get dates, you can just leave off the get dash. You actually say dates and it'll, give, it'll run that command. So like here, yeah, we got the dates. Uh, I can do service, uh, we can do 
you know, get verb, like any get command. Except, except for get process, because process is a keyword in PowerShell for something else. <laughs> so that's the one I can't, you know, demo. Uh, question. Just to, so on that, uh, because that was the thing with get and get process. Like if I write my own Yep, get, you create your own. Now, but it's a soft alias okay. in that if there's an existing command in your system, that always takes precedence. Yeah. Whereas with a normal alias, you define it, it would overshadow like the underlying system commands. You know, like when we had like curl for invoke web request, right? Like that was an alias and overwrote the curl command. But if it was a soft alias, you know, get curl, the existing command would take precedence. That's why we refer to these as soft aliases. And also, if you do get alias, these don't show up. It's just a little bit of magic under the hood. Um, I think if you're really, if performance really matters, it's doing a lot more lookup and it's a little bit, a little bit, of a, a bit of a hit, right? That's why we, nobody ever talks about this. But you might have some challenges in Code Gulf where, man, there's four characters I don't need if I need to call a, effectively a get command. A lot of them do. Um, I think I was, well, I was going to abuse that in a DSLI wrote, and I decided, eh, I'll just use the short command anyways. And so it's a pattern that could be adopted, and um, and you'll you'll save you some linting errors. Uh, but um, I I had headaches with that that soft versus not right, so I ended up not using it that way. Okay. Because then PowerShell knows that you're trying to invoke a command and not and that it's not a keyword, but it's a Yes. That's so okay, so uh, what what I said was so I just mentioned that like get process here. Get process. If I try to actually have the short alias of, you know, process, that's a keyword, so when I go to run this, you know. It, it, yeah, it just doesn't, it's probably not getting an error on that one. But uh, it's not actually executing it. But the trick was, if you need to use process, you actually invoke, invoke it by, by name. And then you remove the space in between, and now you can save one byte, yeah. There we go. One character. a lot of code golf is it's experimenting with nuances and you, sometimes you do a lot of work to save one character. A lot of work to save one character. <clears throat> Alright, so actually let's dive into a challenge here, right? So I'm going to hop over into FizzBuzz. It's a great starting one. It covers a lot of different, different techniques. So, uh, you know, FizzBuzz is where, you know, print the numbers from 1 to 100 with each number on their own line if it's a multiple of five, print the word buzz. If it's a, sorry, if it's a three, print the word buzz. Multiple of five, it's a three, print the word fizz. If it's a five, print buzz. And if it's multiple of both, it's fizz buzz. And if I look at like the first 15 here, we can see the one, two, fizz, four, buzz. And get down to like 15, which is, you know, um, a factor of uh, multiple of both of them, we get fizz buzz. And we need to do that for the whole, the whole, for the whole loop. So I'm going to start, uh, oh, the, the modulus operator. Um, uh, some people don't realize it, but that's like, you know, you're doing division and you need the remainder. It's a very common way to say, is this even or not? Because if I do one mod, or something modulus two, your result is either zero or one to tell you if it's, if it's odd or even. So like here's an example where, you know, three modulus two, give me a, you know, divide by two, remainder of one, would give me the, the one item here. So we can use that with, you know, modulus three and modulus five to know if they're a multiple. So if it's a, if we get a zero when we do the modulus, we know it's, it's a multiple. 
and all right, so here's the nice, clean first pass. And um, like this is something you, you might, you know, um, have in one of your own scripts. Um, and I, and I will start just, I'll just cut out like I would normally code something. I don't immediately go into the golf mode. Like sometimes I, I solve the problem so I can see it and think about it and refactor it before I've gone crazy, like I can't understand anything anymore. Because the further you start chipping away at it, um, the less, you know, the, the harder it is to look at. So this is straightforward and simple, right? We got, we're, we're checking if it's a multiple both, we do this, if else, if else, otherwise give us the number and we, and we kick out the result. And this works as we run this over here, copy paste, run. All right, so we're starting from a spot of like 287 characters. So we can only, we can only improve from there, right? So as I'm looking at it, I kind of, right at the top, I see, actually, I am going to save some things till later in the process. Like some of the white space, I am going to leave in here so it's easier to process and read and understand. We'll eventually yank that out um, where I might trim that sooner than later, but uh, th this code can be hard, hard enough to read as it is. So this white space is going to stay for a little bit. But in this example, right, like, there's probably something clever we could do, because I'm kind of doing the same calculation twice. I'm doing it effectively once up here for both operations and then once down here. So one approach, like, okay, let me see if I can maybe uh, remove the duplicate check, and I could probably, like, append a result. So if it's three, I can actually add the fizz to my results. If it's a five, I can add the buzz. And I've kind of effectively done the same thing, because if it's a multiple of both, I'll have added both fizz and buzz to the, to my little result tracker. In the end, if I have nothing in my result, oh, I know it's my number. I can, I can spit that out. So that's how kind of like, almost like a flag to toggle back and forth between uh, what we want to run there. And we've saved a good number of characters right off the top there. All right, so now I've kind of like tweaked the logic. Let's compress the variable names and the lines a little bit, because there's lots of like, you know, these names are kind of long. There's a lot of characters. So I'm going to use like, you know, R and N, where N is my looping variable, and R is this one, my result that I'm tracking. And just by, you know, using one character variables, which, um, like, I love self-documenting variables in production. Like, my scripts have all these beautiful names. Not in this one so much. Okay. Uh, and then, right, got stuff on one line. Like, it's effectively the same code as above, just shorter variables, and everything's on a single line. All right, so let's start chipping away. So we're at 138. Uh, we go down to, all right, so we're going to talk about iterating numbers, right? So I'm doing this for each loop. We can use the pipeline to get us down to uh, just the alias, which is, you know, 12 characters. So now we're doing this for each over their same logic. And that's, yeah, 25. I guess we're down to uh, 125. All right, so as so I'm looking at these if conditions, man, there's a lot of characters in here. So if we, maybe we could do it differently where instead of um, doing the R plus here, let's, like, let's do that play with things. Let me try it this way and that way and get a little bit of trial and error. So if we could flip this, we could possibly even like we start thinking like, oh, would a, would a ternary operator kind of work in here, right? So one thing about the code golf site is that it is running PowerShell 7. So we get to use some of the newer tools and commands that actually work quite nicely in some of these code golf. And um, the, ternary, the ternary operator is, is one of those. So uh, and it's basically like we've got a condition on the left. Like here's our condition. Uh, if it's true, we do this this value, if not, we do this one. So we're gonna have like, yeah, uh, um, um, basically like a if else right there in one line. So we can take that same operation above and say, all right, here's our condition, is the number multiple of three, and being equal zero, I know what it is. If so, we'll do fizz, if not, you know, I'll, do, I'll do a blank here. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so that, that's awesome, but I think I can get rid of this even more, right? So here I'm checking explicitly for zero. Well, what if I didn't have to check for zero? What if we, we can flip the condition? So instead of having 
but not equals on the right, that we can say, all right, if number multiple of three is anything uh, but zero, because that's true, we'll do nothing. And then if it is zero, which is false, we'll do the fizz. So here we're saying, yeah, so basically anything that's not a multiple of three will do nothing, and the one thing that is, we do fizz. Because, like, yeah, ones and zeros are trues and falses when they are, when, 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 uh, when, when, they, um, when they evaluate it. All right, but there's still, still quite a few characters here. So I'm gonna actually introduce, like, this old school ternary trick we used to use. Well, PowerShell 7, this is nice, sometimes, we can cheat and use some older techniques. And the way we used to do this was you create an array and then index your, your operation because if it's a zero, it's the false value, zero. If it's true, it's the one value, which is you know, the, the second item in, in, in the list. So here we can do off of a, off of a false true, uh, we can get a couple specific values. Now, while, okay, this does look like more characters, but I could also just have a if false. Because I, because if I, if I do my operation right, like, I can actually get to say, all right, so our, um, if I get a null value back, I don't need the null in my array, right? So if I have a single item of fizz, and my value here is zero, I get fizz. If, my, if I index into it as one, I get the thing after fizz, which is nothing, which is null, right? Because you can always index into an array to, to uh, an index that doesn't exist in there, and PowerShell gives you null back. So here, if I get a one or a two, like it, I don't have anything, so it's null. So in a way, I've got a if false statement here to tell me if, if uh, uh, I've got a value. But, so, but here's kind of a nuance, like, uh, it must be an array, or this trick doesn't work, because you can index into strings. <laughs> and you kind of have the wrong, so you kind of, yeah, you, then you get this problem where the zero is the, the F and the one is the I, when you really want it is string or no string. So, um, and, 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 and actually, it has to be right, like, here's just an operation that's giving me a string, and since the result's still a string, I'm still getting that index in there. So the, the nuance is, right, like you have to say, hey, this thing is an array to do this if false trick, which is annoying because that's extra characters. Like, I'm cheating. I, I want these characters back. So I hate putting those in there. All right, so let's loop back to fizzbuzz. We got, um, right, this, is our, this is our example kind of where we left off, uh, if, our if statements, and if we replace those if statements, with this if false logic, now I've taken this line, these, this little piece here was, is uh, 19 characters. I've got, a, I've got a plug in that show me in the very bottom there. Um, I'll look at it occasionally. That says like how many characters I have selected, which helps with code golf challenges. So when I check this one up here, and I check that value, you know, I'm at 28. So, just by doing this really ugly hack, this, I mean, it's, it, it's dirty, but uh, uh, now, we're, now, we're, now we're starting to cook with gas, right? Okay, so uh, the number condition, all right? We've kind of got a lot of characters there. How can we, how can we make that simpler? All right, so right now we're doing the, uh, uh, if the value is nothing, give me back the number. Uh, we can kind of do the same thing with ternary, Right? And this is kind of where it, it could be handy. He's like, okay, if this value is nothing, give me a number or, or return the value. Uh, we flip it to get stuff on the right side. And now we're down to, now we're down to, oh, that's in two lines. But when we run this one, we get the, all right, so if R is false, Give us that. Otherwise, give us the number. But my number's not defined. Where's my number defined at? Oh, I'm going off script here. There it was, there it was. 
does. See, I this rule where I'm supposed to run every line of code in my scripts, <laughs> and then sometimes I don't. And then, okay, so with it being there, so when this is, when this is empty, and we run that line, and then this line here, I get the four, but if my R value coming through the loop is fizz, right, well, we'll get that one, and then here, and then fizz actually gets outputted. So if, uh, if, if we've got something, we, we, we get it, if not, and this is down to like 10 characters for that same effective, you know, if statement that was 24 before. Okay, so, da 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 da. Uh, taking a peek at the old ternary, like the nuance is that you have to have a bool in here. Well, I, I think the back. You can't use a string, right? Like that empty true false worked. My true false worked beautifully before because I was doing number values, um, and those those index beautifully. But like an empty string doesn't index into an array. Like that's one where PowerShell is going to you know throw up and say, hey, hey, we can't we can't do that. So if we cast it as a bool. Then we get the one zero, um, but it's 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 still kind of long. Now we can use this not operator, say not this thing, which forces it to a bool, but the opposite of what you had. So it's like, give me the opposite of what it is as a bool, and then you, you, so you basically have to flip your things again. But it's it's a way that if you need something as a boolean, you know, is it there or not? The uh, the, uh, you know, x nothing becomes flip to be true, and that becomes, becomes zero. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how you could force a, a bool clause. All right, so fixing our statement up again. Now we're 89 characters. Like, here's our ternary, right? So, okay, now we're, now we're starting to really get something here. Uh, we can inline the fizzbuzz, right? Because so before we were doing this, one, two, three lines, well, th these can now just be kind of added together. So now I'm just doing one statement out of the gate, r equals fizz buzz, and there's our ternary. Um, and now I mentioned before we can do this thing where we can assign a value and use it inline. So, like, here's those examples where, where okay, so a is five, I get nothing. If I need to use it in the same calculation, I can do a equals five plus a to get that value further down the chain, which is really nice for the ternary operator. Like you can actually do a calculation here and use that value as your statement and then reuse that variable um, um, later down, later on in the, in the ternary instead of having to do the calculation a second time. Okay, now this gets ugly because what we just did was we took this R assignment I wrapped it in parentheses, and I put it in front of the ternary, right? Like, this is where code golf, <laughs> this is where we now, like, this is where you're, you kind of lose sight of what you're looking at. Like, the code gets really, you know, complex, hard to see sometimes. It's things like this that I saved to the end, because those are the hardest to kind of think through when you need to, like, change your logic or, or back up a bit. Uh, all right, so let's get this one line. We're at 53 characters. All right, but now that I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, is, is, I'm using a lot of characters here for this assignment. So, yes, yeah, so is, that, is, is, is that the best we can do? Uh, all right, so I was looking at our is not. Uh, what if we played with like string multiplication? That, that is something to explore. So if you take fizz times one, I get fizz. If I take times zero, I get empty. So there's cases where this can be really handy, uh, except for this one, I gotta get like the knot of the thing to flip it to get the thing back, but you know what? I have 14 characters and I'm 15 here. Okay. <laughs> one character, it's like coming back to that like a year later, like you don't know what that is doing, right? Like it's, it's a mystery. But that's this same trick, doing the string multiplication. I can do this one plus this one. And um, yeah, so I'm at what, 51 characters here? 
So uh, there's a, okay, so I'm still using the ternary. And there's another operator that PowerShell introduced, which is we're doing referred to as like the null coalescing operator, right? It's like if a null equals a value, you know, assign the value, right? The equivalent is like here, right? So if I can do question, question equals, um, what this means is, is if the value is null, assign default to it. So if you had something in there, it, it won't do the assignment. So it's a way to like do like some like, you know, like seed values in there if, if something wasn't provided. And you can do this in line where you say, oh wait, do the value, but if the value is null, give me something else. So I can now do, yeah. So if you have some input that people are providing um, uh, empty values and, and you need to translate it, this is a PowerShell 7 feature. But the nuance is, um, yeah, so we got here like null, question mark is null. If I run that, we'll actually see the, uh, is null pop up. And if I have fizz in there and I do the is null check, you know, I get fizz. So I get the value here because there is a value. The nuance is it must be null. So a lot of PowerShell lets you use like true and false in like, like null type statements where like null becomes false. And uh, so like in if statements, you can do that normally. And in the ternary, you can do that. But here this is truly is it null or not? So, so a false doesn't work here, or an empty string doesn't work here, which, um, yeah, so they go through this, yeah, if it's, I get a one there, this one here, I get a zero, because it's not null. Um, but versus the ternary, we're a lot shorter. Like, I have to have the space here, because question mark is a valid character for a variable name. So if you're like, I don't like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, you can have yeah question marks in variable. So so that space needs to be there. And the same with the the colon. Like that's how you do like scoping. Like this thing colon whatever is scoping. So so after those spaces. But in the case of this being null, this is shorter. So our one liner. Um, so, okay, so I, I have to step back to our trick of indexing in to get nulls versus what I was doing just a moment ago. I said, hey, let's do some like string multiplication because if I take fizz times zero, I don't get null, I get an empty string. So I was like, that was a great thought. Like I went down that path and then I found this other tricks. So I'm like, okay, let me, let me back up and take it. Like you, you kind of come back and forth at these problems at these, at these lower problems. So oh, I thought this was so elegant when I saw it. And then, then I did, you know, takes it back. But with the, with the null coalescing, right, now I'm down to 45 characters because, mostly because, as I chip away here, so here I literally just replace it with null coalescing. And then I realize, like, you know what? I don't need the value of R again. So let's get rid of those parentheses. I, like, I don't need that. In fact, look, I don't even need to assign R anymore. So I basically, if the value is something, it just falls in the pipeline and we, and we get to use it. If it's null, then we put the number in there. So now, yeah, so I got rid of, I put a lot of work in there getting that R assignment stuff to work. And now I'm like, okay, I, I can get rid of it now. So this is where I was stuck for a long time and kind of where I left off last year. Like, okay, here's, here's where we're at. I have no idea how to get past this. And, uh, it, it was, and actually, uh, somebody gave me a tip here on how to solve it. Um, but before I reveal that, does anybody know the trick? <laughs> I, th I thought one person might, but what we can do is uh, we can use script blocks as strings in the right situation. So here, I've got a script block. Now, I still get a script block, but when it's dumped to the pipeline, output, the contents is what we see, right? So if I run this one here, F8, the contents is fizz. And here, because I'm indexing into 
nothing, it's null. Now, the only reason why that only saves me three characters instead of like six is because you can't add script blocks together. So what I need to do is have a string on the left to force the casting to make the script block a string. And that was the magic sauce that now if we add these, so yeah, I get an invalid operation on this guy. Uh, wait, what? Of course I didn't. Invocation failed, but here we get you know, fizzbuzz together. So the final solution, and the magic is, this part, instead of an array of a string, is a script block. So I don't have the quotes, I don't have the array. And is it actually 42? I thought it was 43. Let's go check that out. All right, so we started with 287 and 42. Okay, 42, that, that's where we're at. <laughs> All right, so, okay, any like questions, comments on that craziness that is code golf in its most extreme, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's code golf. Um, I've got a couple more examples here. Let's see, which one will work best based off of? Let's do, let's do arrows. So this is one that on the challenge site, and it's called just arrows, and the challenge is like you're starting at zero, zero, and the input is an arrow of a direction and you basically got to tell, you basically got to walk the path. When it says we go right, you change your coordinates to say, oh, we went one x, y coordinate to the right or to the left or up and down. Or diagonal, because we have diagonal support here. So if we go to the left, right, we're going x, y to the left, you know, uh, ne negative 1. So this is one of those that sounds harder than it is. And... Um, so, but with the nuance here is like, okay, I can copy paste these values into PowerShell, and when I'm actually doing the prep here, like if I actually want these in something, I can actually just, you know, take this block, I can just delete the stuff I don't care about, right, and I actually have just those values to work with. So whatever approach I take, I can just copy and paste these values in there. So I don't have to know or deal with ASCII codes um, unless you can find patterns in the numerical values of the codes. Like here, there's like a, you know, 93, 94, like, th I didn't find the one in here, but in some challenges you might find that. Like if, if, if the character's all in a sequence, you say, oh, hey, let's, let's use that. But uh, in this case, I'm not, I'm not doing that trick. So the off-the-cuff solution, like so our input, right, is, is these here, here's a sample output, off-the-cuff off the cuff solution is like, well, you know what? If I create a hash table where this is the key and this is the value, they give me an input, I do the hash table, I know what to do, I add it to my x, y, and we, and we repeat, right? So, like, as you find the solution, like, okay, that's, actually, that doesn't sound that bad. And then you look at it, like, okay, that's a lot of characters. But, the solution actually doesn't, doesn't feel that bad at all. So that's where you start to get clever. I'm like, okay, how can I not have just a giant hash table? So, you know, I, 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 so the magic I came up with is, okay, well, what if, okay, let's try something else here. What if I had the set as the key? So now I've got, I got you know, a third less character, like 60% less characters. If the key actually contains all of the values, and I do something where I actually just do like a regex match, like they give me a value, and I see, and I, and I basically ask, does the uh, um, does the key match the value they gave me? So I'm basically treating their input as a regex as a regex pattern. 
So when they give me like the down right arrow, um, and I run through every key, I'm going to get the match of, of this one here, and then I can use that output to do my calculation. So when I run this, Right, I'm getting one negative one, which is the array of, of, uh, is that the right one? One negative one. Yep, so it looked it up in here and got that value. Awesome, awesome. So, okay, uh, using match, but I told you before, we can actually just match against all the keys. Like, I don't have to do the whole for each loop because match works against a collection and a list, and we'll just match the one thing in there. So uh, the fun story is, yeah, I can take all the keys, take their input, and I, get the, the, I can get the key that, that matches it to do the lookup. Ah, it sounded beautiful in theory. Well, it works. I discovered something I didn't know about PowerShell, was that when you do a match statement, it always gives you an array. So, so if I have no matches, I get an array of nothing, if I have one match, I have an array of one, the one item. That didn't surprise me so much. Um, but what surprised me was, so if I got a hash table here, and I, and I look up one item here, right, I get, I get one, you know, if I, you put in multiple values into hash tables, really awesome feature. But if I hit, yeah, and then I, you can go backwards, like, oh, hey, A, B, A, like we can run, you know, do multiple things, it's, it, that's really handy for hash tables. And then, but yeah, but when you're putting an array in here, like, this works, but as I start looking at, what do I get back? So here if I do index of A, I get just the number one, but if I actually have any, hash, any array in here, the hash table gives me an array of, um, um, actually, let me clear that. Let's run this one line. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So basically, I get an array that has one thing in it. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. So in our case, um, so why, yeah, so why does it matter? Okay, so when I run this with our, with our list here, right, like I can get, it's confusing because my array holds arrays, right? And what I ran into was because I was getting an array of arrays, when I thought I could index X and Y, I actually had to like index into the first item to get my X and Y. I'm adding extra characters, like, yeah, I mean, like this is, you're a scientist, like theory, you know, hypothesis, let's see what happened. And, but through that, you know, we get our match operator, and as long as I just, okay, I do my match, and I grab the first thing, but now the rest of this just works. So it was rough getting there, right? You know, bumpy road, but trial and error. Now, but it is getting much more, you know, much more uh, compact. Okay, so now I've got this match logic where I'm matching on the keys, I get the value, and then we, uh, okay, so another spot, we've got a little bit of extra space is, this guy here, like, like the, this one row actually had like six characters to it. And I got to think, well, why can't I just like make that like a, if I find nothing, give me the zero, zero. Like I don't actually have to go look that up because that's like, I'll make that the catch all. So if I tweak this logic here to remove the zero, zero equals, I can use our null coalescing trick to say, give me zero, zero for anything else, which is always those items. So we got to you know, shave off a few more characters just by juggling you know, what a default value is and make sense as. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna start whittling away. Like, I don't actually need to set X and Y to zero because like in the Code Golf app, no variables are initialized, right? So everything comes in as null and we start adding you know, one to null, it becomes one. Like, they become numbers that you start working with them in these cases. So if I, have, if I have null and I add a value to it, it then becomes you know, that value. So basically, these starting as null um, aren't a problem. But 
in my VS Code, I have to do the remove variable for my testing, right? But, but, the, but in the console, um, I have 191 to just by removing that X and Y uh, initialization, right? We're down to 181. And then, okay, so okay, where else can we start saving some stuff here? Well, let's start trimming a little bit of white space. Like if I, if I uh, move, in fact, it might be easier to do it in line here. So if I take this guy here and we like move him up, there's some white space. Take this guy here, there's some white space. You know, we got white space here. Uh, we got white space here. I might not do this one right away because we start getting really ugly. But uh, we'll just do a quick pass of like, like that. And that saves us quite a bit as we're kind of whittling down towards the, towards the middle. Okay, so what did I end up with here? Oh, I guess I did do that. I guess I did that. Sorry. But so everything is on one line where it can be. Then we'll start looking for the next layer of opportunities. So I'm trying to find a way to get these like more in line, right? So we're, we're at 159 characters here. And if there's a way I could do these operations on one line, um, we, might, we might have something. So I go through a lot of trial and error, and, and I have those examples in here, but it's like, okay, so we have, if we have an array by itself, we get an array, but if I put in a string, I get the two values kind of on the opposite the way I want to. Um, I can also like take a string plus the array with, to cast it to a string to kind of give me that same output. And that, I think that's what I end up kind of looping back to. But as we're trying trial and error, like okay, we inline values, X and Y, do we try like, like inside the inside the string? Let's just do the uh, um, um, uh, well, we try basically you know, um, um, invoke the, the variables in line. That's still kind of long, but I kind of sort of come down this path of like, okay, what if we could, you know, do the parentheses around the value to get the value and assign it and put it in the string? Like we're really doing some heavy dancing here, and I keep dancing around until I kind of come up with this where. I have an array of, like, so I do this assignment, give me the value. Do this assignment, give me the value. Put the comma in there to make it an array. And I gotta add a string to it to get it to end up in the format that I want. And doing that gets us down to, see so what were we at before? 159 characters, right? So if we do just that, you know, insane level of juggling. Uh, did I not get anything? One character. <laughs> I got one character through all of that juggling. And it was true, trial and error. Let's, let's push and shift and do this thing. And then, okay, and then uh, my next trick here is, I know we say these for the last, is that you know, I can inline this hash table. Like, I can actually put this hash table like right in here and reference it, right? So now, one more character. We have this monstrosity, because now I've got my hash table here. I'm saying, give me the value of it so I can index into it to do all, all, the, all the crazy stuff to get, yeah, there's, there, there's one more character. Now, we're right at the end, there's actually, uh, one more spot we can save two characters. I don't think we wants to. Can, has, I don't know if you spot it, spot it early on or not. Like it's, it's a real. I don't know. It's a clever one. But uh, see where, where we started doing like the zero zero as the return value to give me you know some some, some values back to do my other calculations. Um, do I actually need both those zeros? Like, see, I'm I'm, I'm using the value zero, but if I get null, that's zero in math. Close enough, anyways. So, by deleting those two characters, uh, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got proof here, but down to, yeah, 155 as our final answer. That's doing the walk from what was beginning just a nice clean hash table lookup. Arrows. run. But yeah, so like, like here you can see the, 
Like, yeah, the, the inputs are individual characters, so the array loop works perfectly. And there we go. Now, I have no idea. Somebody's more clever than me well, has gotten this really. I've got a question. Sure. Tables, you don't have to put quotes around, at least normal strings. Ooh, good call. Let's see which ones it likes and doesn't like when we do that. Completely overlooked that one. I didn't even test it. So we're at 155, 139. Ooh. Missing closing. All right, let's do, let's just check one of these, right? But there might be, a, there might, there might be something there. Because, like, I'm at 155, but the leaderboard here, a mystery to me, is 66. Um, I've got more than 66 characters in my hash table. Right. <laughs> Ooh, you know. I wonder if you could get rid of all the negatives by just using a, like, incrementing everything by, say, three, and then doing a minus three just during your output. Oh, uh, I removed it from out the data mic from the mic. to it in this one. Might, might be something there, but something to play with, right? Like that's, you get those ideas and we're like, you tweak and you play. Like that's where, you know, I'll, I'll probably spend another two hours chasing that thought. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent, okay. So I'm doing time here. I'm going to jump to 12. <laughs> it is absolutely that. <laughs> uh, that's why every once in a while I'll post those challenges and I will distract people away. All right, this one, um, 12 days of Christmas, right? Simple concept. We need to basically print the song on the first day of Christmas, yada, yada, yada. And then we increase the line each leap through. So. Here's one where, like, okay, simple attempt. I decide that because the name changes, we'll just do days, like a list of days, first through whatever, uh, the song, each line, and then I'm gonna basically loop through. So each time we do a, uh, each time we do a loop, we'll basically output the rows of, of song from the index down to zero. So I'm basically doing like a reverse, like, on the first one, we'll get this one. On the second one, we'll do two, then that one. So basically, we're kind of almost doing this reverse, like print this line, then that line, then that line. Because I'm going to basically count down from you know, a higher number down to zero, reverse, reverse direction. So if we accept that's what that does, uh, and we, we start whittling away at ways we can make this you know, tighter and cleaner. So we've kind of already said, hey, we can compress the arrays right, by using this echo statement. So I can echo all these names. There's a ton of quotes, just vanish, just like that. Um, oh, I can show you that uh, VS Code, right, has really beautiful multi-line editing. So we need to do something like that. You can kind of do the, like, uh, shift alt, you know, delete. Uh, actually, let's not do that one yet. Let's do the uh, end. We do that. I can do. Uh, home, delete, space, right? Like, so there's some cool features in VS Code to help you, you know, hack some of these, but down the rabbit hole there. Uh, all right, so, uh, all right, so we take our array of strings. Let's see how we can kind of make this cleaner. So, so instead of doing the, the array of strings, we can actually do like a here string and split on the new line. 
because that's a valid thing to split on to get, get my array. And of course, we realize that I don't really need to hear string, right? We can actually just have a string that runs multiple lines and split on the new line. So pulling those pieces together, right, I get a, uh, uh, an array of my first, second, third, fourth, whatever. I get my song that I can reference, and my loop is still the same, right? Through each one, we, 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 we pull, we, 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 we run the items, you know? And I'm doing the split to make sure we have a nice, clean array for the indexing here. All right, we already learned that, hey, the for loop, man, there's so much room we can, we can save there. So we'll convert the for loop to a for each object loop, right? Just do the counts, we know the numbers, the, the range. So this part, we can just loop over with a for each object. All right, so, but then I realized, like, you know what? I already have, like, my days is the exact size of the looping I need. So I could actually just loop over that first collection I made, right? Because right here, we're running the song, a loop once for, First, every every day of the every day, every day of the loop. So in that case, let's let's just instead of actually iterating numbers, we'll pass in the days, which means I don't have to look it up either, right? Because I was looking it up before, you know, based off of an index. Well, let's just you know inject the value um, in line, and then if I'm you know doing that, we actually just put the variable in line. Like I don't, I don't need to do the do the, the the format string anymore. So yeah, variables in line. Uh, all right, so I'm at, yeah, so here we go. So we're looping over days, in line, that one, ch that one chunk. So pulling this back together again. Uh, we have our setup, looping over our days. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting nice and tight here. Uh, in fact, here I'm just saying, like, man, I'm defining the days, and I'm just using the days here. We can inline that pretty easily. Right, so now we're just doing, I move it down, so we say echo all the days. As we scroll over, right, we're just looping off that. And I've gotten rid of an entire variable, like that, that days variable vanished. I didn't have to shorten it, I just got rid of it. Excellent, okay. Um, I felt like, for me, there's a lot of repeating in here. Like, I see this pattern, like, you know, there's lots of like new line commas, Maybe that's, uh, there's this ing comma, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Um, let's just do a little substitution. So my hack was, let's just put a variable ing, that's a little bit expensive, but if I use it enough, I save enough characters, so I'm at, what, 462 from 464. So four characters, <laughs> by shoving extra variables in there. Oh, oh, what fun, oh, what fun. But, but yeah, getting tighter and tighter here. Uh, we can inline, okay, I can, I can inline the song and remove the indent, right? Like I'm, I'm creating the variable song and I'm only referencing it once. Like, I don't even need a variable for that, do I? So, to get down to 436, I put, So I basically do the split, and then uh, reference into the resulting array. Now, um, uh, what am I missing here? Okay, and then to actually make it complete, um, I move this new line as well. Like I kind of found like, oh, you know what? I can actually new line here. If I just shove this thing up on top, so full circle here, I actually do open quote, return, and then I have to change my logic a little bit. This is one of those cases where I actually flipped my plus plus i from i plus plus. Because before I wanted, you know, zero to zero, like, but now I actually want to start from one, to, like, so yeah, it's just one of the cases where like, yep, if I flip that zero, I can actually just reference that in there, I save, you know, two characters, give or take. Okay. Uh, almost done, like I was initializing I, didn't need to do that, right? Because I know in, the, in a runner, I will always be null. When I do plus plus, they'll become zero or one the first time it's used. So there's another variable I need. All right, so um, 
Okay, so there's one more savings here, and somebody already mentioned it earlier, uh, was that, like, I actually, I was caught on this one for a while, but uh, if we take this new line, out, and just put a new line there, that still splits the string on that loom line. Like, that's, that's what we kind of mentioned earlier, like, <laughs> Do not do that in production, please, I beg you. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so that, that, that's down to four 24 characters. And that's where we end up with 12 Days of Christmas for Code Golf. And then we run that one. Now, I was planning to do prime numbers, but I kind of ended up cutting that one for time. But the example is still in, in, my, in my repo. So I post all of my talks out here on, a, on a GitHub. And the uh, Code Golf one is here. I haven't merged this into main yet, but I do at the moment have a summit branch. Yeah, summit 2024. <laughs> <laughs> it was late. It was late. <laughs> I'm prepping for next year. No. Uh, uh, but yeah, so the highlight there, before we kind of, I suppose we dive into questions and discussions of these things with the prime numbers is for quick flash, down to 35 is my final solution on that one. But the exercise is here if you want to follow through it. So, boy, that was fun. <laughs> so, yeah, like it's like it's just a way to like mentally unwind, you know, do something a little bit different. It, it, it's for the ADHD or nerve sniping, something to just kind of distract your focus from, you know, other stuff that's going on. And, um, yeah, I've burned a lot of hours just in a way picking and experimenting and learning how PowerShell works. Like there's many things in here I learned by saying, what about this, what about that? Like just trying things over and over. Many of those discoveries, I'm like, I had no idea I didn't need that dash, you know, like replace and the extra character, like at, at the end, to, or the replace and do remove. I'm like, yeah, so many of these things I discovered through that process of trial, error, what, and challenging my assumptions. Like, does that really need to be there? Okay, yes, that one does. Like, does that one need to, you know, like, there's a lot of those that, you know. So, excellent. Uh, any questions or things we want to loop back on? I know it was a long, a long talk, so I appreciate you guys kind of sitting through all that. Sure. Yeah. Maybe, right? So here, okay, so here's, we gotta do the math, right? So it's one, two, three. So I got three references of three, or sorry, four references of three characters, so I gotta do it in less than 12, but it's gonna cost me two characters to put a variable in there, right? So now I gotta say is, can I, in four characters, define a variable to replace it there? Like, that's where I got stuck at this one. Um, but if we look at the board on this one, like if we look at the board on this one, like somebody's got, what, 14 characters on me, right? So there is something in there. And um, yeah, so I, see I, I got 14 characters to go yet. So there, there is a big saving somewhere. Oh, sorry, there's, I, so the board does both bytes and characters. Let me go back over to characters. I tend to think in characters. So where am I at here? I'm at 424 characters. Here's somebody in like 198 characters. But, but I will say, but the bytes are pretty similar. So they could be doing some like, there's like, and the reason why they have that distinction is sometimes you can do some like, clever stuff with encoding, like, oh, hey, if I have 
this encoded in Unicode, I got extra data to reach in and do something with. In fact, one of my um, attempts with the prime numbers was to, I was gonna store a bit string, like a 64-bit value, with the ones and zeros for which values would have been prime or not to just look into. And anyways, it, it didn't work for what, you know. <laughs> You can filter to PowerShell. So you could choose whatever language, but the board is in your language, and there's an overall board if somebody wants to dance across lots of them. And then I will say, I said that I've had some ugly solutions to a lot of these. So the first thing I will do when I'm doing one of these, where's one where I have like a really poor score? Uh, I think I can sort this by points. Like this guy here, I got one point on this solution. Let's play this hole. What did I do? I ran it and I copied and pasted it. I, gra yeah, I grabbed the output and pasted in the solution. <laughs> I'm on the board, right? You get points. Uh, especially when they like add a new challenge, right? You do that, you could be like the fourth person, I mean, like you'd be the first person and have a thousand points for, until people start, you know, beating you to that trick. So, yeah, 20,000, <laughs> but it passed. Um, now, usually performance doesn't matter. Um, so, like the prime, you know, the first 100 primes, like that one's a pretty quick one. They've got one like the first thousand primes that they have like a limit on how long that one can run. So your one solution might be elegant for one and I try it in the second one, it just times out. So they're saying, okay, not only do you have to be clever, you also have to be efficient and it changes your whole algorithm and approach. So, excellent. All right, well I think we can wrap that one up right here. Um, um, yeah, I appreciate everybody for coming. I'd love any feedback and we can catch, you know, talk out in the hall for more of these nuances and if you guys discover little things like this that partial works in ways that you think most people wouldn't expect it to work, you know, go ahead and ping me. I, I love those gems. So, excellent.